Hello everyone, thanks for coming outside me today. Today we get to dispel one of the biggest archery myths that I've been fighting for absolute years, and that's bow efficiency. And we broke out a chronograph and draw force curves and everything else in order to prove it. One of the biggest myths that I fight, whether in person at the actual shop or online when people want to purchase a bow and they want to ask questions about it, it's the whole, my bow is more efficient when it's wound all the way tight and if I back the limbs off, I'm losing efficiency. And I'm here to tell you today, happily, with actual math behind it, that that is wrong. You do not need to do that with today's equipment. But there was actual truth to it many years ago, and that's why I have this old ancient Martin Jaguar here on the table. So we have to go quite a ways back for this myth in order to hold any water, at least 15, if not 20, 30, or even 40 years ago, in order for this to actually ring true. And it has to do with bows that do not have floating limb pockets. So for those of you that are still in the ILF or takedown recurve or longbow market, you understand this all too well. This old Martin Jaguar compound, I would say probably is in the late 80s to early 90s. It is a cast riser and you'll notice when the limb is wound out, it doesn't actually sit in the pocket. It actually sits up against the bolt and it has come out of the pocket and it's come out quite a ways on either side. This back in the olden days with bows like this, this would mess with the tiller or the distance between the string and the back of the limb pocket. This would mess with the timing of the bow, so on and so forth. But in today's world, we don't have bows that are built like this, not in the compound world anyway. Definitely those of you that use ILF or the International Limb Fit System with uh, modern day Olympic style recurves and other hunting bows that use an ILF system, you understand that you can play with this a little bit and play with your tiller. Modern day bows though, however, the riser is so flat on the end and the limbs are so parallel or past parallel, they are definitely no longer this D shape that we had 30, 40 years ago. So let's get out with the old and in with the new. And here we have an Athens Vista 35, although all modern day compounds, I would say really from about 2010 and onward, definitely have a floating limb pocket system. And what that means is the limb pocket or the part that actually holds the limb in place is actually not part of the riser. It's its own standalone unit that bolts into the riser. So these little black grommets here, these are actually a threaded uh, bolt nut system, if you will, that just are simply placed inside of the riser. So we don't have to worry about stripping out the riser by winding the bow in and out. These are machine risers nowadays compared to a cast riser. They're much stronger, a lot more integrity to these. You notice that they can have all the Swiss cheese cutouts, of course, because there's so much more strength with this aluminum than there was with the old cast risers. So since these limbs actually compress more and they are more parallel or past parallel, meaning that they come into each other instead of sitting 180 degrees, there's a lot of tension put up underneath into this limb pocket to lock these limbs in pace place. You have pins on the underside, you have little uh, shim spacers that are pushing it to the outside, really locking this and making this a high integrity system. Every major bow manufacturer on their flagship bow or even their mid price bow is going to have something for this. And that also means when they wind the limbs out, the limb pocket follows the limb because it's not part of the riser. It's bolted to the riser. The limb pocket follows the limb. And so you get a lot of high integrity. You get a lot of high tolerances, even though those limbs are backed out. So I took this exact bow, this Athens Vista 35 here, and currently I put 70 pound limbs on it. I usually run all my bows with 60 pound limbs, and that's what these are, and that's what I've been shooting for quite some time. But I reached out to Athens and said, hey, what if we build this whole bow efficiency video idea? Could you get hook me up with some limbs that are 70 pounds? I'll do a whole swap, and that way we'll be able to have actual numbers. We'll play with the draw length, make everything tuned, everything's really nice and clean. We're not doing two separate bows with different modules, everything else it's the exact same bow exact same cams exact same strings everything's exactly the same we just have two different sets of limbs one that we wide out to 60 and one that's cranked all the way down to 60. now i did not film any of the shooting through the chronograph because of all the lights and the size of the shop down here it's really hard to maneuver everything around with the chronograph the target the draw board the press and everything else had to break this bow completely down of course you know pop out the axles and the shims and the cams and everything in order to change over limbs wasn't a painstaking 
filmmaking process, but with all the other stuff around, I don't have any footage. I just took pictures as I went through. Also, because I have a draw board, I was able to make some draw force curves and we'll go over that data as well as we talk about how this bow maintains efficiency, whether it's at peak 60 or wound out to 60. So my usual setup with my 60 pound limbs is 30 and three quarter inches of draw length. I push the uh, module on the Athens to be the 80% let off sitting. I can go 80, 85 or 90. I tested today at 80%. I use just the standard 60 pound limbs that I always have and they peaked exactly at 60 pounds using my draw board and scale. I was able to go inch by inch and actually build out a draw force curve and we'll talk about this here in a little bit but also then I just set the bow up and shot through the chronograph just using my standard hunting arrow which is a Sirius Supernova 2.0 standard 300 spine stock 12 grain insert 125 grain point total arrow weight comes out to 466 grains I shot that three times through the chronograph and got 266 and once 267 in terms of feet per second very respectable hunting speeds a little bit on the slower side uh, definitely for a standard bell curve style arrow but it tunes really well for me and we're not interested in about the speed in terms of how high or how slow it is we're more interested in consistency and 266 267 could not be more perfect I then took the bow and did a whole complete swap over to the current now 70 pound limbs and then I was able to build a draw force curve out for that and again we'll compare and contrast the two in a little bit I had to wind the bow out three and three quarters turns to get down to 60 pound peak as well built that like I said through the draw board uh, made sure everything was still in time it was the bow is currently not set up for that hunting arrow either with the 60 pound or the 70 pound limb it actually was tuned with a 60 pound limb to my uh, gold tip 22 series which are my hunting arrow so I'm sure it's not tearing a perfectly clean hole through paper with either set of limbs so I'm going to throw that out completely as a variable because neither arrow or neither limbs excuse me are set up with that hunting arrow right now I shot three arrows through the cross chronograph and got three exact duplicates of 267 feet per second so we have exact speeds you know one feet per second at the most between the bow that is at 70 pound peak wound out to 60 or a 60 pound peak that's wound all the way in so let's actually talk about the draw force curve and why this is even just as exciting to me as uh, the feet per second is in terms of the efficiency because it's really showing me that this bow regardless if it's at 70 wound out to 60 or 60 wound all the way in is going to feel to the end user almost identical if not actually identical because there is some variance with the scale you know obviously we're starting here with a little bit different peak weights and we'll talk through all of this uh, as we go through talking about these draw force curves but first let's go through the bow set up as I've been shooting it all winter all through the tail end of deer season all indoor season so far uh, we're starting out at 10 inches of draw length remember your brace height's already at six and a half at least it is with this bow it's six and a half inches so we're there's no real point in getting a peak weight before about 10 inches Inches. So at 10 inches, we are at 8.8 .8 pounds. And then as you see, as we move through, the big number to worry about is 12 inches uh, because that's really starting to get into the actual draw cycle and how it actually feels uh, because that's where both of these 70 wound out and 60 cranked all the way in start feeling exactly the same. And if you can tell the difference of a draw force in the first four to six inches, you're Levi Morgan. You shouldn't be watching this video. So at 12 inches, we hit around that 37 pound mark. And then as you see, we peak, peak, peak. And then as we get to about inch 17 or 18 in the draw cycle, we hit peak uh, draw weight. Now, this again is at 30 and three quarter, just based on how I can adjust that Athens uh, with the uh, adjustable let off. I can rotate between 80, 85 and 90. And that kind of gives me micro tune adjustments and quarter and eighth of an inch. So I have it all the way in at the 80%. So I lose about a quarter inch of draw length. And so that's why we're shooting around 30 and three quarters for the uh, for the peak here so around that 17 to 18 and then right around the 23 ish 24 ish we really start to come down so you have about a six to seven inches of that draw force curve where you're at peak weight you're at that 60 pounds and that's where you're peaking and you're holding that for that six seven but it's right in the middle and you'll notice then it really starts to let you off at least at my draw length it really starts to start to forgive you around that 25 inch mark and then it starts to gradually come off you notice it's not a straight cliff drop 
top. It definitely is a, uh, a pretty steep slope, but it's a draw force curve after all. It's a pretty steep slope as it goes down. And then of course it goes back up at the beginning because at the end, excuse me, because I hit that back wall and I start pulling it a little more and the scale goes back up. Key takeaways of this bow set at its quote unquote peak is about that 17 inch mark. You hit peak weight, you're at peak weight for about six to seven inches. And then it starts to gradually let you, self, let you off until you get down to that 80 ish percent let off. All right, so over to the 70 that's wound out to 60. And this draw force curve looks a little different. And again, I blame this mostly on the tolerances of the scale and just where I'm at. Again, those first two numbers, like I said, the 10 and the 12, the 10 on the 60 pound model was at 8.8. .8. The 10 on the 70 pound model wound out to 16, uh, excuse me, wound out to 60 is 15.4. So it seems like it's double, but then if you look at it, that 12 inch, uh, the uh, 70 pound wound out to 60 is 38.5 and the 60 pound at peak was 37.3 so they have caught up to each other both at that 12 inch mark and again if you can feel in that first six inches the difference of that or if my scale truly was on and, and there is a difference there then more power to you right there at 13 inches we got the exact same 46.2 pounds uh 14 we got 54 and 53 so we're all within a pound here uh and then we get to about that inch 18 mark uh, which we are now at 59 and a half. So we're right there at peak weight at 18 inches into the draw cycle, which is exactly the same within half a pound. Again, tolerances here within half a pound that we have on the 60 pound peak model. We're then at peak weight until we get to about that 25 inches into the draw cycle. Now it doesn't start. If you look at the curve here, we definitely have about an inch of variance, but it's an inch of variance here where the 60 pound starts letting you off a little bit sooner. Uh, and the 70 wound out to 60 lets you you off about an inch later again if you can feel that inch in the draw cycle more power to you i know that i personally can and then we have this kind of weird blip again i'm going to blame this on the scale here uh towards that end but you notice it's still a very steady drop off as it goes down and gets back down to about that 10 pound range which you would expect for that 80 ish percent let off but i want to go back to peak weight here so if we look here at the 70 wound to 60 15 16 17 about that 18 inch mark we hit peak weight and then we're let off about 24 to 24 and a half inches so there we are again a six to seven inch window of the draw force curve that we are at peak weight just like we are with the 60 pound that's cranked all the way in and peaking at 60 with its limbs we still have that six to seven inch window where we're at peak weight and we still have that same pretty general gentle slope as we come down into the back wall the draw force curves again at the beginning they look a little funky but in the middle and in the end where it really matters where you're really working through and trying to get through the, the uh, draw cycle and get into your shot sequence, they feel exactly the same. And I can attest, because I shot these through the chronograph multiple times to get those duplicate numbers, even after I stopped taking pictures, I can't feel a difference. They both feel like 60 pounds. I've been shooting that 60 pound. I, I don't even know how many thousands of arrows I've put through on these 60 pound limbs this winter through all the indoor practice and now getting ready for springtime 3D. Compared to what I've here, just a couple dozen out of those 70 pound limbs, it feels exactly the same. It humps over the same, it breaks the same. It's still a very smooth draw cycle that I've come to expect with this Athens Vista 35. But the exact draw force curve, now the math actually backs that up. It's not just my brain telling me that. Now, are all models and makes of every single bow manufacturer gonna be like this? I have no idea. But I can tell you right now, this Vista 35 is holding its efficiency, it's holding its draw force curve, and it's holding its draw cycle, peak weight, back wall, and everything, regardless of whether it's a 60 pound wound all the way in, or a 70 pounder that's wound out to 60 pounds in order to meet that peak. So I'm sure I've rambled on way too much about this data, but if you can't tell, I'm really excited to actually have this data in front of me and actually have done the math myself. It's always kind of been a conjecture for me based on today's modern equipment and everything else, the tolerances of all the bows and strings and arrows, everything else in today's modern equipment that it's basically a moot point and one feet per second different, same bow, different set of limbs, it's timed and tuned, everything's great. I think it's a non-point and it's a non-factor when it comes into you purchasing a bow and whether or not you need to wind it out or keep it at its peak performance. 
So that's all for this video. If you have any further questions on chronograph numbers, data, draw force curves, draw boards, or anything else that pertains to this video or the sport of archery and archery hunting in general, please follow the links in the description below. Hit me up on Facebook and Instagram, Average Jack Archery. Send me an email, averagejackarchery at gmail.com, or drop a comment here on YouTube with your own experiences of winding a bow all the way in or winding it out and how it feels to you, how it shoots for you, and how it tunes for you in the long run. Hope you're able to get outside, enjoy the sport of archery, archery hunting if you so choose. Definitely enjoy God's beautiful creation, and we'll get to see you next time.